Santa Pod, Bedfordshire, and in the heart of rural England, the first weekend in July, witnesses the cannonball run. I'm Eric Michel, and along with John Price, we shall be taking a look at the extraordinary world of drag racing. The biggest engines, the fastest cars, and match racing side by side over a quarter of a mile to get the fastest possible time and the fastest acceleration rate. Drag racing started in the late 40s, early 50s in America, where the kids, tired of speed restrictions enforced on them on the roads, decided to go looking for their excitement elsewhere, and taking over disused airstrips throughout America, started racing their massive V8 engine cars against one another, side by side racing along a quarter of a mile stretch. In the mid-60s, enthusiasts in Great Britain imitated their American cousins and brought the sport to the shores of the United Kingdom, where Santa Pod soon became the premier drag racing strip. As technology has advanced, it's affected the world of drag racing, but at the end of the day, it's all about getting the most out of that lump of metal. Drag racing is not only about four wheels, it's about two wheels as well. In the sport at the moment, there are many classes involved with drag racing. In the bike world, we range from the street machines right up to the massive 14, 1500 cc's nitro burning power units which can complete the quarter mile in seven seconds at incredible speeds approaching 180, 190 mile an hour. To transfer that amount of power down onto the tarmac, it's all about tyres. Here we see the machines warming up the rear tyres prior to a run on the quarter mile. The idea of this is to get that machine, the compound of the rubber, as hot and as tacky as possible in order to get the traction on the start line to commit as much of the power that the engine is producing onto the track. The rider now approaches the start line and waits for his signal to go. completes a rolling burnout, just another method of heating up the rear tyre ready for competition. Tony Lewis on his turbocharged Kawasaki putting in yet another eight second run to thrill the large crowd at Santapod. Turbocharging does tend to quiet the bike down considerably as opposed to the fuel burning competition bikes which form the larger part of the motorcycle field. Here's another interesting way of warming up your back tyre. Hard up against the control tower at Sandapod, a pro stock bike warms the back tyre to get that back compound nice and tacky. Mike Beaumont, a giant of a man of over six feet, sing astride his green Suzuki called the Eliminator. Putting in a practice charge away from the line, this is what he would do in competition to make sure that all his reflexes and the machine are working properly so that he could come out and try and beat his opponent to the end of the quarter mile. Winding on that throttle as he goes along the quarter mile and then suddenly nearly a tragedy as the fire truck turns out in front of Mike Beaumont. Well, it's called Eliminator and certainly that's what may have happened. Once again, the tyres are warmed up prior to moving up to the start line. Alan Jeffries here on Denringer, a 
1325 Kawasaki and its turbocharged. Up to the start line, the almost silent scream of the engines, and then disaster nearly strikes. Those two incidents go to prove how easily and how close the massive pressure and the danger just around the corner is ever present. Back in the paddock, it's the cars. And these are the funny cars. This is what drag racing at the Cannibal Run is all about. Funny cars, because that's exactly what they are, they're funny looking cars, are these massive eight litre engines cocooned within fiberglass bodies with chassis made of titanium. These cars are the Formula One cars of British drag racing, capable of reaching speeds of up to 250 mile an hour on a standing quarter mile, taking just the lower end of the six second bracket to get to the top end of the strip. Feverish activity on all the vehicles getting ready to come out onto the quarter mile for their qualifying session. But first, all other classes must put down their qualifying runs. As the cars line up down the side of the strip in what is known as the fire-up lane, hours and hours of preparation have brought the culmination of effort right here in front of a huge crowd. With only eight spots open for the fastest eight funny cars, the competition is heavy. Preparation is intense in the fire-up road where the mechanics put the final touches to the cars in readiness for their drivers to be strapped in to these eight litre nitro-methane burning fuel injected monsters. The Cannonball Run is a true international meeting with drivers attending Santa Pod from America, from Scandinavia and from Europe and in funny car the heat is on. Colourful names of the cars as they come down the fire up road ready to run. The Motown Shaker from Norway, that's going to be the ride of Runa Field. Showtime and Budweiser, the rides of the two Americans in the race this weekend, Tom Hoover and Harlan Thompson. Wild Bill Sherratt, a past winner of the Cannonball Run in the Cannonball Car. Dave Page in the ever popular Panic Funny Car. Tony Bowden in the Hitman Funny Car. And Alan Bates, the crowd's favourite, in the Hound Dog. The drivers themselves are preparing to get ready to enter their cars, putting on their protective clothing. Danger, of course, being present alongside the driver. The driver is buried deep behind the engine in the very rear of the car, almost excluded from view even when the body is lifted up to start the engine. Andy Craddock, 
getting himself prepared to put in his first qualifying run in the frontline car. On go the fire-resistant gloves, fire-resistant boots, and a full fire-resistant suit. Fire is the ever-present danger. When you're using fuel such as nitromethanol, each explosion in the engine chamber is a real explosion in every sense of the word. The starter motor is on, the adrenaline is pumping. The qualifying goes on, but with almost total and immaculate preparation, there are times when all the gremlins gather together in one place and make it a seemingly impossible task for some drivers to get out on the strip. Harlan Thompson and the Budweiser team had nothing but problems during the Cannonball weekend with a brand new car. It was frustration and anger which eventually drove Thompson out onto the strip to prove one thing he could most certainly do it. His Swedish crew chief and the rest of the team had worked frantically all weekend, trying to find out exactly what had held this car back. In went neat fuel into the air inlet that feeds the supercharger. The engine was fired up and the crew chief stood back. Thompson was going to do one thing, he was going to put this car out on the strip and prove to one and all that the brand new Budweiser funny car was capable of taking on anyone he cared to race against. The 1986 Pontiac Trans Am moved forward. A huge smoky burnout showed that Harlan Thompson was very definitely back in business. Blipping the throttle, he chirped the engine, keeping the rubber hot and the tyres clean. The 1984 and the 85 Cannonball champion, Harlan Thompson, had been cruelly cheated of the opportunity to put in three in a row. But he proved his point, six seconds down to the quarter mile. We moved on into the eliminations proper. And the final four into the eliminations were a really mixed bunch. The Showtime Corvette, of wily American old-timer Tom Hoover, the man with a 500 cubic inch Keith Black engine in the car. 
500 cubic inches relates in cc's to eight litre that each one of his cylinders is equal to a normal mini engine think about the power that you've got under your right foot with an engine of that size he came up against British man Dave Page in the all-popular, always reliable Panic Chevrolet Monza. The crowd at Sandipod waiting expectantly for this race between the American and the British man. This is what they'd come to see. An Anglo-American tussle out on the drag strip at Sandipod. Mixed feelings were evident from the crowd. American servicemen who'd come along to the Budweiser run, cheering on, obviously, their hero, Tom Hoover, the British contingent right behind Dave Page. The two funny cars moved up towards the start line. The ground shook from the noise of the two eight-litre fuel engines burning away on the start line, and then they were off. Tom Hoover noticeably out in front and held the lead right the way to the top end, taking a very convincing win over British man Dave Page. But a good run nonetheless from the Page family and the panic Chevrolet Monza. Tom Hoover going forward into the final, but who will he meet? One look in the fire-up lane and anyone in the crowd would tell you Hoover had got tough competition on his hands. A re-look at this run and the brute force through the rubber. Waiting at the front end of the fire-up lane, wild Bill Sherratt in cannonball. And just behind him, Rune Field from Norway, his crew frantically working to get this car ready to go out on the strip. He'd been late down into the far up road, Rune Field. The crew was still working on the car as it was towed down. For being such a hot day, Bill Sherratt, sitting in his fire suit at the back of his funny car, was getting too warm. So he decided, I'm going to go for it. And that's what he did. He started the car up, came out onto the strip for the burnout. But where was Rune Field? His crew had been working frantically on the car. Runa slid the car around in a four-wheel drift, just narrowly missing someone else's tow truck, and came straight out onto the strip, putting down an incredible smoky burnout, much to the surprise of all the fans present. Well, here we had it this time, the Anglo-Norwegian tussle, the young man from Norway with filled-in side windows, a very unusual thing to have on a funny car, lifting the escape hatch on his car so all the acrid burnout smoke could escape. While Bill Sherratt in the left-hand lane, Runa Phil from Norway in the right-hand lane, and who will be going forward to meet Tom Hoover in the final? They're both away together. It's a good run from both drivers. It looks as though Sherratt is out in front, but he loses power towards the top end, and Runa Field takes the win. The parachute's billowing in the breeze, slowing him from 220 mile an hour to zero. The fire crew just racing after the two cars to make sure both pilots are okay. But that's the final for us then in the Cannonball Run, 1986. It's non-British, American versus Norwegian, Tom Hoover against Runa Field. But before the final of the International Cannonball Run can take place, a more extraordinary event has yet to be shown before the crowd. This is the Santa Pod Match Race Jets giving the crowd what is called the Flame and Thunder Show. As the two drivers bring their cars up to the start line, you can see the reason for the name, the flames coming from the back of the jets as they crack on the afterburners, and the thunder represents the noise these two machines make as they sit there waiting for the green on the start line. Here we go, both cars are into the staging beams, the drivers holding them on the brakes and they're away. And it's Mark Woodley with the Hellbender car, reaches the top end first, his parachute's coming out to slow the car from speeds in excess of 220 mile an hour, right back down to zero once more. 
The tension now mounting, the crowd waiting for the final of the 1986 Cannonball Run. In the final are an American and a Norwegian. No British cars have made it through, but that doesn't stop the tension building in amongst the grandstands and the viewing areas for the crowd. The two cars come out with a side-by-side -side burnout, proving that both are in business to take the Cannonball Trophy. Runefield from Norway, Tom Hoover from America. The grip juice goes down for both cars, that tacky substance that gives them more traction on the start line. Runefield, the man who must be classed as the underdog, up against the old stager, the American Tom Hoover. They move up towards the start line. The crowd are on tiptoe in the stands. Here they come, into the staging beams. This is going to be the automatic operation that starts them. Runafield moves straight into stage. Tom Hoover is there. Here comes the green, and they're away together. And nearly a tragedy there as they move towards one another. And who takes the win at the top end? It's the Norwegian. The underdog who nobody thought would win. The Norwegian takes the trophy home for 1986. Runafield is the cannonball champion. Down at the far end of the strip, the two cars wait, quietly surrounded by smoke, for their crews to come and collect them. The result was unexpected, the effort extraordinary to avoid disaster. Only the superb reactions of two really top-class drivers saved what could have been a very nasty situation there. The two cars coming within four feet of one another and the two drivers having to correct one way and then overcorrect the other way to keep the cars on a straight line. But let's not take anything away from this young man who has taken the world by storm, the 1986 Cannonball Champion, Runa Field. Almost three months later, the end of September, many of the teams have returned to Santa Pod. Alongside them, a number of faces that we haven't seen before. This is the Top Fuel World Finals, the result of months and months of preparation and hard work, for only the very best will win here. It is a full international field once more, with drivers from all over the world, from America, from Scandinavia, from Europe, all conscious of the fact that they have to try to beat the British on their home ground. Activity in the pits once more is at fever pitch. Everybody wants to look superb at the world finals. Everybody wants to put on their best show, put down their best run in front of the biggest crowd that Sandapod has seen for many years. And this meeting heralds the return of the big cars the top fuel dragsters. The cars which are so rarely seen in drag racing in Great Britain these days now return to enthrall the crowd with their 250 mile runs along the quarter mile. Down from Sweden comes Monica Erberg, and yes, women do race in this sport. 1982 saw her step into one of these cars for the first time and now four years later here she is in one of the biggest cars at the most prestigious meeting in Europe. The crew getting the car ready for a qualifying run for Monica. She'll be looking for the number one spot in the top fuel drivers event. We're mixing here funny cars and the top fuel dragsters and everything points to the top fuel dragster being the quicker vehicle on the quarter mile.
but that's the big vehicles. You can come into drag racing at many different levels. Dragsters and competition altered cars vie for position in the sportsman categories. And here, yet again, another lady competitor takes to the strip in this A35, running with a massive 390 cubic inch Ford engine, which equates to something like six liters in English money. This is Stephanie Millen, bringing the car up to the start line, running alongside a five-window Plymouth coupe bodied altered of Mark Riches. And the man gets to the top first, but it's not always that way in drag racing. Competition altered cars form the backbone of drag racing in the UK. It's a stepping stone up to the bigger divisions, the bigger fuel divisions. Cars run with fiberglass replica bodies and V8 or V6 or straight four highly tuned engines. The sounds are absolutely ear-splitting as pair by pair the cars make their way down the strip. Relentlessly, the drivers and the riders pursue their best times and top speeds at the quarter mile of Santa Pod Raceway. There are even street cars taking part in their own event at the same meeting, cars which you may even find parked in your garage one day, although highly churned, and normally American V8s with high performance parts. Quite often, you get a British car with an American V8 engine in it. Believe it or not, this used to be a Marina Coupe. It now runs somewhere around the 10 second mark on the quarter mile and is acknowledged to be one of the quickest street cars in Great Britain. Next up from street cars, modified street cars. This is the sort of thing your neighbor doesn't want to see you washing on a Saturday morning. Very noisy and very quick modified street cars. These cars can complete the quarter mile in anything between eight and nine and a half seconds. Extremely fast, the racing enjoyed immensely by the fans. Another form of racing which hasn't caught on too well in Great Britain is pro-stock car racing. Small American family saloons with large V8 engines, sometimes up to 500 cubic inches, i.e. 8 litres, racing against one another on the quarter mile, completing the distance in 7 seconds. This is really drag racing, door slammer style at its best. Fast and furious, Will stands on the start line and then thundering runs along the quarter mile in a short time. As motor racing has become more popular over the years, crowd control has posed a major problem for race organisers. Perhaps the exception to this is a drag racing strip, for here the members of the public can walk all the way round the paddock and see literally everything that there is to be seen. The World Finals here at Santa Pod, and once again the bikes are back. If there's one element you need for drag racing, it's warm weather, preferably as much sunshine as possible, because those tyres have to get hot, and so does the tarmac. With drag racing originating in America in the warmer climates, it's become difficult for race organisers to guarantee action all day long. Hot summer sun, and a British autumn, and the crowds are packed along the banks on either side. You can't take it away from the motorcycle, lads, they put on a great display for the crowds to enjoy. Bikes can range from single cylinder machines right the way through the card until at the top of the competition bike table, we even have some machines running with three engines in tandem. Here's one of the top 
quickest bikes in the country, Bill Blackbogle, on his expanded quarter scorcher machine. And just look, is that front wheel touching the ground or not? Phil is leaning the bike from left to right to try and keep it on a straight course to go through the finishing gantry at the top end. He has recorded low seven-second runs on that machine and is certainly one of the two quickest English bikes in existence at the moment. Burnouts are all important. And here's one young man warming his rear tyre against the control tower at Sandipod. But there does seem to be more smoke coming from the front of the engine rather than the back. And oh yes, we do seem to have a slight problem. Luckily, he's noticed it, as has one of the Sandipod fire marshals who will come undoubtedly to his rescue. And yes, there we are, standing by. I'm sorry, I've got to put that out. If you must, it seems some people will risk everything just to get on the line. Turbocharged or no, that bike had to retire. But down in the paddock, one of the most famous men in drag racing, Sammy Miller with Vanishing Point. This is a rocket car. Sammy, Vanishing Point is an infamous car, if you can call it a car. How do you describe it? Well, it is a car. It has wheels and that. The only difference is it doesn't have a normal engine that drives the wheels. It's um has an actual rocket engine like they use to land on the moon, and it's powered by thrust. The thrust pushes it, and uh, I describe it wild. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you compare this car to a normal piston engine car in terms of uh, performance and speed? Obviously, it's a lot quicker, but uh, if you were able to calculate it out, how would it work out? I, I think the word, not to scare me, is more like, like it's terrifying. This, this vehicle has so much power and speed, you, you really have to be on top of yourself when you drive it. A normal piston car, you, you, you get up to the high end of the curve of RPMs and you start to fall off and you shift it, and, and you, you want it to go faster. With, with a rocket car, you want it to go slower. You keep telling yourself, shut off, shut off, shut off, because, I mean, it just never stops slamming you in the seat. It just keeps pushing hard. Um, it's a little breezy today, and I don't think we'd be pushing a 300-mile-an-hour mark with it, but we will try and run a good four-second run with it, and probably around 260, 270 miles per hour. Um, Everyone, you know the car can run 300, it can run three seconds, but conditions have to be absolutely perfect. Is this it, or is there anything more than this? Uh, we're going out October in the uh, next three to four weeks, and we're going to run the first ever 400 mile an hour quarter mile. Well, there you have the greatest showman in drag racing, slamming Sammy Miller. The American who's been virtually adopted by the crowds at Sandipod for his thrilling 300, verging on the 400 mile an hour runs in his rocket cars. This is the third vanishing point we've seen here at Sandipod. Once again, it's a funny car body. It's a Pontiac Trans Am body, just the same as Knight Rider, although completed in Sammy's own vanishing point colors. Sammy just getting the engine ready now to fire up on the start line. And the incredible thing with a rocket car is that it's quiet until it's ready to go. Sammy is pushed up into the staging beams by willing helpers and then the crowd at the racetrack get ready to count Sammy down rocket style to complete his quarter mile run. And Sammy Miller completes the quarter mile in four seconds. The thing you can't do with Sammy is sneeze or blink or you miss it. But if you have, here it is again. The crowd show their approval for the adopted son of Santa Pod Raceway, Samuel Arthur Miller, known throughout the world as Slamming Sammy. The afternoon rolls on, and along with the smoke, the mind-bendingly loud sound comes that distinctive smell of burning nitro. The top fuel cars line up to do battle. And first round onto the strip is Sweden's Lee Anders Hasselstrom. The last time the crowd at Sandapod had seen Lee, he was sponsored by the Swedish Air Force, no less. Now running in the colors of Coca-Cola and astonishing everybody at Sandapod by putting down a five-second run in Funny Car. 
This is going to be a great afternoon's racing. With Lee going through the top end at 235 mile an hour, he suddenly becomes the man to beat in the afternoon's competition. Next car out, the Cannonball car. 484 cubic inches of Keith Black power. And only for his second time, the man in the hot seat is John Spufford. Young John, who suffered a very nasty, funny car fire at a meeting prior to the World Finals, trying his hand at Wild Bill Sherratt's old ride, the Cannonball. Is this going to be a good run for John Spufford? We'll have to wait and see. He's a novice driver, only recently moved up in the ranks to funny car. This could be the making and the start of something big. He moves into the staging beams. The crackle of the V8 engine resonating around the strip in the afternoon sunshine. There's the green. And it's a good run for John Spuffard, completing the quarter mile, but bouncing very, very heavily. The parachute coming out very late and the paramedics rushing down the strip to check that John Spuffard is okay. This is a normal precaution undertaken at any drag race strip. And once they have assured themselves that the driver is okay, the fire engines have assured themselves that there's nothing on fire, everything returns to its normal position. As the afternoon wears on, all classes head towards the final of their division. Here we see pro comp cars in the semi-finals of that category running alongside one another and it's an Anglo-Swedish tussle. A smoky burnout from the Swede, Tony Brittenson, says that he is in full competition and looking to take the title of the quickest pro comp man away from England's Steve Reid, the man in the opposing lane. With a wild, wild ride, Steve Reed gets to the top end first and moves forward into the final, only just beating the Swede to the top end. The ear-splitting noise, a reminder that the top fuel cars were back in the pack. The fumes from the burnt fuel is enough to make tears run down your face. Gary Page, in panic, had taken the Chevrolet Monza out in qualifying and had broken, he never made the final runs. But, as always with the Page family, Gary put on a display to warn everybody of the excitement yet to come in fuel racing. Bringing the car back behind the start line after the initial burnout, the idea of the burnout to warm the tyres, to put down rubber strips on the strip itself so that the car can launch on its own tracks of rubber. Here Gary launches hard from the start line and goes for the four quarter mile. Out comes the parachute which will slow the car down from some 200 mile an hour to round about 40 mile an hour when Gary can apply the brakes. Sure enough, later in the event, out comes Runefeld from Norway and on the opposite side of the track, Tom Hoover from the United States. This was almost a rerun of the Cannonball Run final. That time, however, Tom Hoover was sitting at the controls of his Showtime funny car. Here he is with a complete change of ride, now sitting in the hot seat of a dragster. What, you may ask, ever prompted Tom to go back 
to the dragster as opposed to the safe confines of a funny car. Or somebody just simply offered him a chance to try his hand at something he hasn't tried since the 60s. And that's the result. An incredible side-by-side -side run with the Norwegian Runa Field. Who got to the top end? It was Tom Hoover by a whisker. If you were standing at the finishing gantry, this is what it looked like to have Tom Hoover come snaking towards you in this top fuel dragster at some 210 mile an hour. What an incredible driver. Drag racing is all about show and go. And one of the most professional looking teams at Santa Pod for the world finals in 1986 was the Budweiser team of American Harlan Thompson. In a rare quiet moment, Harlan managed to find time to talk to Eric. Uh, the Budweiser car today, tell me how things are going for you. Gee, the car started to run real great, but we had a little problem when I had to shut it off, but we're going to go out and run some more, and I think it'll do real good today. The closest competition for you this weekend being which car? Probably one of them top field drags is either Tom Hoover from the States or the uh, girl from up in Sweden. Yeah, and uh, I've seen you race here already once this year. How does Santa Pod feature as a, as a drag strip in Europe? I like it. I had, I had real good luck here at Santa Pod. I've been coming here for five or six years, and I think we have an awful good win record here. And I enjoy the crowds and the, the whole thing around this area. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the Budweiser car the engine and uh, what you do to it to hopefully get ahead of somebody else? Well, actually, everything on the engine is a special made just for drag racing. It has about 2,500 horsepower and runs on nitro-methane fuel. It usually runs in the fives about 250 to 260 miles an hour. So Eric took his microphone over to the pit of Monica Urberg, a lady of few words. Monica, Santa Pod, and it's the World Finals this weekend. You've been putting some incredibly fast times down on the strip. Uh, Tom Hoover, of course, very strong competition. Are you looking for a win here this weekend? We surely do hope so. Well, Monica, very short on words, but certainly not short on bravery. That lady was out there in competition later on in the afternoon sunshine. When Harlan Thompson had said to me earlier in the day that he felt sooner or later he'd end up running against Monica, he was not wrong. The two of them rolled out onto the start. Monica was in the pit lane, furthest away from us, and Harlan in the spectator lane. Both cars, having completed their burnouts, pulled back behind the start line, ready to come back into the staging beams to put in a run. Monica, in the pit lane, was under orders from American crew chief Gary Bergen not to have any grip juice down. Gary had set the car up to run on what he thought was a hot strip. But as we will see, the best laid plans of mice and men, and in fact, lady dragster drivers, doesn't always work out. Here we go then, into the staging beams, and waiting for the green, and they're away. And Monica lights the tires up, spins the tires, but then at the last minute, Harlem's car breaks, and Monica gets through and takes the win. Hoover completes his ear-splitting burnout and reverses back behind the staging lights. Nearest us is Andy Craddock. He's waiting for Hoover. So the preparation's completed. Both cars now approach the staging beams. 
They always say that the first one into stage is usually the man to lose. But we shall see. It's America in the left-hand lane. Great Britain in the right-hand lane in the hands of Andy Craddock. And Andy Craddock breaks on the start line, allowing Tom Hoover to solo through to go into the next round with his top fuel dragster. And a dejected Andy Craddock is pushed back away from the start line by his crew. Months of preparation lost in a split second. Meanwhile, the rest of the drivers wait. Can you imagine what it must be like sitting in the afternoon sunshine waiting for your 200 mile an hour run? But now it's the turn of the Norwegian Runa Field in his green and black Trans Am. The body goes down and he comes round into the pit lane. Coming round into the spectator lane, the American in another Trans Am, Harlan Thompson. Here we go with the burnouts. That's Runa Field, strong and smoky. Harlan Thompson lights up those back tyres, smoking his way over 30 or 40 yards of the first part of the drag strip, putting down two tracks of rubber, which he will then park the car on to leave the start line in the race. Still trying to keep those tyres warm and clean, Harlan chirps the Budweiser car up to the start line. What a beautiful sight this makes. This could be in the heart of America. Two up-to-date Trans Ams, side-by-side -side racing, funny car style. The Norwegian goes into stage. Harlan Thompson eases the car into stage, but it's Harlan Thompson who goes right out of shape, away from the start line, and the crewman says it all, throwing his arm dejectedly towards the ground. Runa Field is through to the next round of Fuel Car. With still a few rounds to go of competition, the jet cars of Santa Pod were brought down the fire up road to put on their flame and thunder shows. Eric spoke to the driver of the Sealing Vampire, Colin Fallows. Now, Colin, um, can you describe to me a little bit about the performance of, of this Sealing car and uh, and really what it feels like to be on the on the start line? Well, on, on the start line, you've got so much power behind you, you have to regulate the thrust of the engine. <laughs> so the car doesn't skid forward and skid straight through into the through the staging lights. Um, we have an afterburner fitted, which um, doubles the engine power. Uh, you're trying to regulate the engine power and cracking the burner for the flame show at the start is quite hard. Uh, if you watch, you'll see the wheels locked up and the car being pushed along. Getting the car into stage is very hard. You obviously want as much power as you possibly can uh, without sliding forward. And then you've got to get 100% power on to launch off the line uh, and then open the afterburner. So what effect does that have on you physically when you leave the line? Um, leaving the line, it's, it's not as bad as people make out. You pull about 3G, which is three times your own body weight. Uh, stopping at the other end is another thing. Uh, you use the parachute first to initially slow the car down. Uh, when the parachute comes out, that is quite a jolt. Um, it's more painful than actually launching. Uh, once the parachute, parachute's out, and you're slowing down, you then go onto the brakes and bring the car to rest. No one was to guess that this would be the last time we would see fellow competitor Mark Woodley alive. 
As he talked quietly and confidently to a crew member, the two jet cars waited to be called out onto the strip. Hellbender just behind Selig Vampire. Every available area for spectators seemed to be packed right around the course as the jet cars move forward and up to the staging lights. Both cars and both drivers going through the normal preparations that the jets make as they come up to the start line. The flame and thunder show, the cracking on of the afterburner, being carried out like any normal race meeting day at Santa Pod. Nobody knew of the tragedy which was just seconds away. The afterburners cracking on, showing out even in the bright sunshine, the large flames at the back of the cars. So coming up into the staging beams all seemed in order. No one was to know that this was to be Hellbender's last run. The green was on, both cars were gone and the run seemed perfectly normal up to the finish line. But then suddenly, Hellbender turned dramatically left, straight across the nose of the ceiling vampire and destroying itself on the armco on the left-hand side. Woodley's Hellbender even clipped the nose of the vampire on its way to destruction. The emergency services were on the scene straight away, but to no avail. Mark has given his life for drag racing. 34-year-old Mark Woodley died instantly as his car hit the barrier at the top end of the strip. What caused this tragic accident, we should never know. He will, however, be missed by his family, his friends, the fans and competitors. <laughs>